I'd like to now introduce a very special person for our keynote address. She has over four decades of working on women's empowerment as collectives, economic, grassroots. She is the director of knowledge building and feminist leadership at Kriya. She is also the co-founder of many organizations, four organizations. And those of you from Karnataka that have heard of Mahila Samakya, she is the co-designer of the concept of Mahila Samakya itself. She has created large communities of women in rural Karnataka and in Maharashtra and built them into activists and leaders. I'd like to invite Srilata Bhatliwala to, it's an honor and privilege to have her give us the keynotes. Good morning. Namaskar. Salaam Alaikum. I'm very, very happy and very honored uh, to be here with all of you today. My sincere thanks to India Women's Caucus for inviting me to do this keynote today. I also want to give you in advance my apologies that I can't stay with you throughout the day as I would very much have liked to because of some personal responsibilities. I'm especially thrilled to be here since you have set out on this very important mission of challenging the male domination in our political system, in our political parties, and in all our political processes. But also because I hope you have also set out to transform Indian politics from deep within its core. Because I don't think that the goal of having more women in politics is a useful goal in and of itself unless women transform politics, which means that women have to transform the meaning of power and the practice of power. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that today and especially about what are the barriers that we have to confront, especially some hidden barriers that I think we've all sensed, we've experienced, we've seen, but we need to see these barriers in a new way in order to address them much more effectively. I also want to apologize to be speaking in English. It feels very awkward to be speaking to a group of uh, women from across India who are so committed to this change um, in a language that I know for many of you is not the most comfortable one. So if there's any word or any term that I use um, that you find difficult, please don't hesitate to stop me and ask me to translate. So I decided to begin, now Tara's given me a very strict time limit of 20 minutes. And because of this time limit, I have decided, normally I speak ex tempo, but I've decided to uh, write out uh, what I want to say to you, and I also have a few slides. So I thought it would be interesting to begin the day for all of you by telling you a story. A story that some of you may have heard about, but I'm fairly sure many of you have not. This is an amazing science fiction story called Sultana's Dream. And it was written over a hundred years ago in 1905 by Begum Rukaya Shakavat Hussain one of pre-partition India's great feminist writers and activists. This is a story about a dream in which Sultana, the heroine, finds herself awakes in a green, peaceful, prosperous, beautiful country called Ladyland. And this country is run entirely by women. The women scientists of the land have developed solar power and technology that enables them to control the weather, till the land without manual labor, harvest water from the clouds, 
and move about in flying cars. There are no police or soldiers because there is no crime and there is no war. The only religion practiced and allowed in Ladyland is love and truth. But as Sultana's local guide, Sara, takes her about the country, Sultana notices one very strange thing about this otherwise utopian, idyllic place. There are no men anywhere. Where are the men? Sultana asks. Oh, says Sara, we keep them safely locked up in the Mardana at home where they belong. But that's crazy, says Sultana. Why, says Sara? Do you think it's wise to keep sane people locked up in an asylum and allow the insane to roam free? Of course not, says Sultana. And Sarah says, but that is exactly what you do in your country. Men who are capable of all kinds of mischief are let loose and innocent women shut up in their homes. I often wonder when I read the papers every morning why we are doing just this allowing the seemingly insane to run our country while millions of our wisest people, women committed to honesty, peace, development, tolerance, human rights, and justice are rarely allowed to rise to leadership. But this, I think, forces us to confront some of the many myths that have been perpetuated to justify this exclusion, to justify the very, very minimal presence of women in our political processes. So let's look at the myths one by one. Myth number one, women are not interested in politics. They want to manage the house, children, go to the beauty parlor, watch movie, TV serial. Really? Why then do millions of women contest elections? Why do thousands of women campaign as independents, knowing they will probably lose because parties won't give them tickets? Why are one million women sitting in our panchayats Zilla Parishad, state legislatures, and national parliament. Somebody has dragged them and tied them there. Let's remember that this is exactly what they said a century ago when millions of women were joining the freedom struggle, burning their imported saris and textiles, giving their gold to the movement. Even my own grandmother did that and faced British lathis and bullets to win freedom for our country. We were side by side on the streets. I don't think that's a lack of interest in politics. I didn't know that women are not interested in politics because when I was 15 years old, I campaigned along with my aunt Sudha Reddy in 1967 and she became elected as the MP from Madhugiri. And Leelawati Aure, you have been a great mentor and friend uh, to her. So I didn't know women were not interested in politics. From the time I was a teenager, I thought it was quite normal. My own 40 years of experience with grassroots women, with young women activists around this country and around the world tells me that women are not just interested. They are passionate about politics because they are passionate about justice, about peace, about safety, about economic development, about the health, education, and well-being, not just of their children and families, but of the entire community and of the earth, of the world at large. And all these are political issues. 
If we can just have a look at the first slide now, I think it also tells us a story that debunks this myth of the lack of interest in politics. I'm sorry I wasn't able to include the 2014 data, but what this shows you is the number of women who have been contesting elections, uh, national elections, over the last, let's say, 20 years, and the percentage of them who have contested as independents. Just look at the number. It's increasing. And I hope to include the 2014 data and share it with you when uh, these slides are uh, distributed. So let's move on. Uh, Tara, if you can close that. Uh, if you can go back to the, yeah, just go back to the title slide. Let's look at the second myth. Women are not competent to be in politics or handle governance. They need capacity building. Just look around you, look around this room, and look around the country. Does the state of this country, the declining quality of our democracy, the persistent poverty, the rising number of farmer suicides, the destruction of our forests and our environment, the impunity with which female fetuses are being eliminated and skewing our sex ratio to historically low portions, and women and girls violated on a daily basis in both public and private spaces. Does any of this indicate that our politics and governance currently dominated by men is in highly competent hands? What I see is competence in the lowest form of politics and in the worst practices of power. Unfortunately, this is a low form of politics, what I call politics with a small p, that far too many women have had to imitate if they want to gain the patronage of party bosses, get a ticket, get elected, or survive in the political system. So women, if they want to succeed in this current political culture, have to become men, or what my Latin American feminist friends call women with mustaches. Just men masquerading in female bodies. So I think everyone needs capacity building to govern well and practice a different kind of politics. Would you agree? I don't want to see women's capacity built to succeed in this low form of politics, the politics of corruption, patronage, mindless loyalty to party bosses, and narrow ideologies. I would like to see everyone capacitated to practice the politics of accountability. Accountability to the rights and needs of the electorate, to peace, justice, inclusion, and equitable development. If women lack the competence and capacity to govern, let's consider what has happened in countries where the majority of elected representatives are actually women. That country should be a mess, right? Because their capacity is so low and they're so incompetent and only interested in TV serials. So you may be surprised, or some of you may be aware, that it is not some Scandinavian country that ranks number one in terms of the number of women in parliament, but the humble African nation of Rwanda that leads the world in the percentage of women in its parliament, 64%. According to the World Bank, so let's see what they've done with this. According to the World Bank, Rwanda has achieved impressive development gains since the 1994 genocide initiated and committed by men and the civil war and has vigorously guarded its political stability. 
the World Bank found that Rwanda's strong economic growth was accomplished by substantial or was accompanied by substantial improvements in the standard of living of the majority of its people. And a two-third, two-third drop in child mortality and near universal primary school enrollment. The parliament's strong focus on homegrown policies and homegrown indigenous ideas and initiatives has led to significant improvement in access to services and human development indicators. Their overall poverty rate dropped from 44% in 2011 to 39% in 2014. This doesn't sound too bad to me. Where is India? Where do we rank in terms of the percentage of women in political leadership at the national level? Guess who's in the top five? Rwanda, Cuba, Colombia, the Dominican Republic, and Mexico. India is a pathetic 152nd out of 190 countries. And we only have a billion plus people, you know? So we don't have enough women, clearly. We are a pathetic 152nd out of 190 countries, way behind even our neighbors, Pakistan and Bangladesh. Shame on us. Shame on India. Let's come to the third myth. Women politicians are more corrupt and worse, more autocratic than men. Don't you love that one? Well, from what I've seen, for women to succeed, as I said earlier, in any male-dominated profession, I think Tara and many of you would confirm this is equally true in the corporate sector, in the police, in government, they have to become harder and tougher than men simply to survive, let alone succeed. So yes, it is unfortunate that many of our most prominent women political leaders have either become women with mustaches or have had to distance themselves from their identity as women to succeed in the political arena. But let's be clear, it is not women who created the political culture of corruption, cronyism, and lack of accountability that has placed our country among the worst ranked in the Global Corruption Index. I don't even want to go there. So no, we don't want to see more in women in politics if they are going to be women with mustaches, but we want to see women transform politics, not politics transforming women. So what stands in the way? What is going on? Despite millions of women entering the political arena, why are we unable to break through the glass ceiling, or should I call it the iron wall or the brick wall of male domination in the political sphere? The answer is simple. Many of you know it. Many of you have experienced it. But organizational behavior theorists, people who have studied organizations as systems, call this barrier the deep structure of organizations. So if we could have the first um, slide, Tara, on the deep structure. So let's look at deep structures. What are deep structures? These are the hidden but very real ways and dynamics in which individuals and organizations reproduce the norms, biases, and power dynamics of the larger society that they come from. For example, political parties are governance bodies reproduce. They have deep structures in which something very different is going on from the stated objectives or the uh, explicit mission of the party or the governance institution. And I like to use these two images to illustrate the point. The first one, if you click, 
This is the overt structure. This is not the deep structure. The deep structure, remember, is the hidden stuff. It's the hidden kachra that is actually going on behind the scenes. But in the image that we present to the world is like the Buddha. Huh? We have this wonderful party manifesto. We are deeply committed to gender equality, women's rights. We want to end violence against women. We want to end the killing of our girls, right? The mission is perfect, it's beautiful. Look at how many women are members of our party. Look at how many women we are fielding, etc. So that is the Buddha. That's the overt structure, the open structure, the visible structure. And here, if you click, Tara, is the deep structure. It is a bed of snakes where the real politic, if you like, of these institutions is carrying on. Now let's look at that bed of snakes. Let's look at some of what happens in the bed of snakes. Tara, if you click to the next slide and click again. These are some of the dynamics that commonly occur in the deep structure of organizations. This includes NGOs, it includes corporations, and of course it includes uh, government, political parties, trade unions, what have you. There are all sorts of informal norms that contradict the formal rules. So what does this mean? That if I am a woman party member, I have to behave in certain ways, the expectation for me. And I remember in Maila Samakya days, the classic example was they used to tell me in Kannada, Madam, now member agidivi, Panchayatali member agidivi, now chai marve kante. I am a member of the Panchayat, I have been elected, but they tell me your job is to make the tea. Okay? So there's an informal norm which is reproducing the household division of labor, that uh, gender patriarchal division of labor. Next. You have all kinds of behavior that is actually rewarded and uh, uh, encouraged. One of them is maska, malam, patti, hai na? Jo vesa karte hai, unko jada jaga milti hai, jada awaz milti hai. So we encourage certain practices, those who do this cronyism, the uh, favoritism, doing personal favors for the, for the boss, they get more power, more voice, more place. But is that what the party manifesto says? Who should be getting the most space should be based on their work, their commitment, their actual, uh, what they are delivering in practice. Next, uh, there are all sorts of hidden power groups Hey, ki nahi? Ye point kuch bolna hai? Aapne baut dekha hoga. There is some formal structure. President, vice president, treasurer, secretary. Aur unke piche kuch aur hain. All kinds of power groups that are actually controlling the whole machinery from behind the scenes though they have no explicit legitimate authority to do so. Is there a problem? Okay. Next. So when there are hidden power groups, what is going to happen? All sorts of hidden decision-making processes. Greg Govinder, who was an MP in the South African Parliament, told me the story of how the South African Parliament passed the largest defense appropriations bill in its history, where something like 24% of the national budget was given to defense by a hidden decision-making process where the male members of parliament realized that the women are going to fight this bill. So they met in their clubs, in their pubs, in their 
bars and in their sports uh, football club uh, houses and made all the decisions and tabled the bill at the very last minute. The bill was this many pages, 2,000 pages, so that the women could po not possibly read the whole text. It was written in highly complex, jargonated legal language. They gave it to the women, uh, women in the minimum number of days required by uh, legislative norms, and the bill got passed. So this is because there's a whole hidden decision-making process going on that we find it very difficult to intervene. And the last one is practicing a lot of personal biases and beliefs that uh, we also, I know you have experienced. Okay, so I'm told I'm out of time. So I had one last slide, which I mean, which was on what, how do we tackle these deep structures? And I do want to share this before I conclude. Because many of you have already taken the first step in tackling deep structure, which is you to recognize that it exists, that a lot of hidden power dynamics are actually what's keeping us outside the political system or unable to have an impact on it even when we are inside. The next step is also a step you've begun taking is to come together. You have to mobilize because when an individual tries to challenge a deep structure, you know what happens to her. She's finished. She's just expelled from the system. So we have to come together. We have to name and shame these deep structure dynamics. And we have to use many creative methods to do this. And I can give you many examples, uh, but I don't have time. Women have to collectively also build parallel processes. This is very important, and this is one such parallel process, what you're doing right now. Because you have to build real living examples of an alternative, okay? And again, I have some beautiful examples where on the ground, at the grassroots level, women have created some of these uh, you know, really strong, concrete, clean alternatives. And things like Nari Gram Sabhas, the Nari Adalats, the Tamil Nadu Women's Jamaat Movement, where now more men are bringing cases than even women, et cetera. And finally, I think this is a real challenge I'm giving you. You have to resist playing by the men's rules to succeed in that game. You have to res resist because if you join that game, you will get short-term gains and huge long-term losses, which is exactly why we are here today. Because in 60, 70 years, what have we gained? Nothing because we played the short-term game. So to end very quickly, I want to give another story which I found personally very inspiring of a young woman from Allahabad University, Richa Singh, who in, 1920, uh, in 2016, Richa became the first female president of the Allahabad University Students' Union. She was disgusted by the decades-long culture in the student union elections of violent, money-powered, party-based campaigning. She decided to stand as an independent and won the election, hands down, when no independent ever had managed this in the past. But throughout her campaign, she fearlessly and calmly faced intimidation, death threats, a bomb thrown outside her hostel window. Why did she win? Because she campaigned through her values and through her honesty. She refused to be a party puppet. Allahabad University Student Union elections are a preparatory ground for UP political careers. She refused to participate in this. She promised students I will work for your needs and priorities. Repairs of our hostels, better toilets, an improved library, better facilities on campus. And rather than advancing, 
her own political ambitions, she showed her fellow students a real alternative and they voted for her and she won. So I think Richa's story and that of thousands of amazing women like her teaches us that women actually have a choice. If their values and goals are clear, if we present a real alternative model of leadership and power, if we build our collective power, and most importantly, if we challenge and change the rules of the game and create new rules, if we enter political arenas not for the sake of power and advancement, but to transform power, then and only then can women transform politics. Thank you.